Hello, and welcome to Keeping It Real, the podcast where we talk to the most interesting people in real estate, and we got a good one for you today. My name's Chris, your host, and this podcast is brought to you by Real Geeks, but we're going to talk about them more later. So we're just going to dive right into it and get going. All right, it's the crossover episode that no one knew they needed. It's keeping it real and keeping it real. DJ, here, why don't you introduce yourself? So thanks, Chris, for for having me on. I'm a huge, huge fan and supporter of Real Geeks. Uh, So we have a show, and Real Geeks is a huge supporter of our show, which is also uh, titled, uh, completely by coincidence, the same exact (laughs) title as your show. So uh, for better or for worse, we are joined at at the name, and I, I couldn't be happier to have you joined at the name with us because we're such a big fan of, of your company. And anyway, so what I do on, on my keeping it real is it's actually similar to what you guys do as well, which is I speak to top producers from all over the country. I've been doing it for six years. We have uh, coming up on, I think we're at about 650 episodes. So it's a lot of fun. I do a couple of those a week. And if you haven't ever checked it out, in addition to subscribing to Real Geeks Keeping It Real, please subscribe to Keeping It Real. For us, just do a search for Keeping It Real, whatever podcast app you might be listening to. Look for the one that says by DJ Paris, that's me, and you will find us and uh, we appreciate it. Right. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, we're all about winning together here. And I think the way, the way that we found you is we were probably Googling ourselves and we're like, wait, hang on. These guys have our name and they're outranking us. You know, like we better just sponsor them. Uh- <laughs> I love it. We're, yeah, we're, yeah. we're, it's, it's really funny because when people do ask me about the show, when I meet people in the, in the industry, and I always go, God, I wish I, not, not because of you guys, but I say, I wish I would have chosen a different name because after I chose the name, keeping it real, I just chose it on my own. I didn't mm-hmm. like think maybe I should look up to see if there's other podcasts because it's not only just you that has a keeping it real. There's a bunch of others that are called keeping it real as well. Right. So, right. And there's some other celebrities that have like keeping it real. Yeah. I think Jillian Michaels, maybe That's the even one I'm the, thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. Jillian Michaels has a keeping it real one, the, the weight, uh, weight loss fitness expert. So, um, Thinking about delivering value to the audience here. When you're naming your company, Google it first. <laughs> did you, do, do you guys have a real, is there, there probably lots of real geeks out there too? Or, uh, is it just you guys? No, no, there's actually not. I think, uh, I think there might be one other company, but you know, we're, we're also to the size where like no one else is like messing with us. Uh, so that's, that's thankful. But, uh, you know, I think also it was sort of a, uh, it was sort of a, like a obscure enough name, but it, it also just like talk about describing the culture of the company. Uh, you know, we're into real estate and we're pretty geeky. So, I mean, it's, it's just nails it. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, I feel the same way. So I'm, I'm, I feel like that's me as well. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So talk to me about your background. Like how'd you get into, how'd you get in real estate? How'd you, and then, you know, from there, how'd you end up doing a podcast about it? Com- by accident, um, getting, getting into real estate was I was a marketing um, marketing person for many many years. Branding, business development. I worked in. I worked at one point for Anheuser Busch. I worked for Morgan Stanley, um, uh, a, a couple of IT companies, uh, smaller firms. So I, I did nothing to do with real estate. But my yeah. realtor, when I bought my first condo, which was a million years ago, he and I were friends. And so when I got laid off from an IT firm and I needed a job, he was like, hey, you can come help me build our broker, his brokerage. And it only had a couple of realtors. And I said, well, I know nothing about real estate. And he said, no, no, I, this is really a marketing position. Mm-hmm. And so we started sort of thinking about how we could attract realtors to join our company. So our company is called Kale Realty. We're in Chicago. We have just under 800 agents uh, now. So we've, we've grown a lot. We're really super grateful for that. And it's a lot of fun. And I get to build this business with my friend and uh, about six years ago, I said, I, I, I want to do a podcast because back then we really didn't have a lot of training for our own agents. We do today, but back then we didn't. And I thought, well, maybe I should start interviewing the top agents in Chicago, seeing if they would be willing to talk to me right. and just ask them, like, how'd you do that? And then I could pass that through to our agents. And that was kind of my initial thought. And then I was like, well, why would I just share it with my own agents? Why wouldn't I share it with everyone? And also these other agents 
they're not probably really going to want to do it up an episode with me just to promote it to my own, our own agents. They want, of course, to use it as a promotional tool themselves. Absolutely. So I was like, Oh yeah, exactly. You guys do a similar thing. And so, you know, that was, um, 630 episodes ago. And it just, now we have a staff, uh, for the last three or four years, we have a staff, uh, three or actually four people that work on the show and we couldn't be more grateful for that. So, yeah, that's that's my story, and uh, I I I do say I when I'm at social gatherings and people haven't met me before, and they say, "What do you do?" I I don't like to say I'm in real estate because I truthfully don't always know how to answer. How's the market doing? Because what I'm not, I am not a practicing agent. I'm a licensed agent. I do have my license. Yeah. I've never used it. But I have talked to the best top realtors in the country. So I think I probably know something. Uh, but, you know, market specific information, especially here in Chicago, uh, I'm a little bit in the dark on, even though I've lived here for 20 something years. So, um, so I'm good with marketing and branding. And I think I know how to build a realtor's business. Um, but I don't know how to get into the trenches and, you know, figure out things like how do you price a property, things like that. That's perfect. That's perfect. And I think that's a great segue for, you know, what we wanted to like, why we wanted to talk to you because, you know, 630 episodes, that's a lot of top producers you've talked to. And we're like, okay, <laughs> th this guy has been busy, you know, let's, let's have him help us distill down, you know, mm -hmm. what's going on out there in the world. Not at, not at a local level, but like maybe at a sure. national level and yeah. talk about some of the big trends that, you know, people are buzzing about right now. So there we go. Let's do it. Yeah. All right. So, I mean, Biggest and buzziest uh, right now. I mean, not interest rates or AI. We'll we'll save those for a little bit later. But the NAR lawsuit has got yeah. a lot of people talking. And I'm really excited to hear that you're a marketing person because I bet that you and I probably have similar opinions on this. So mm. I'm, I'm interested to get your like, you know, your take on like what led to this lawsuit and maybe catch people up for people that, you know, don't don't know the ins and outs sure. of what's going on. And then we can start to start pick this thing apart and figure out you know, maybe a good course of action. Yeah. So I was funny enough. So the national association of realtors happens to be headquartered in Chicago and the Chicago association, our local association happens to be in the same building as the national association. So I'm at that building. I volunteer at the Chicago association a, a lot. So I was actually there yesterday. Now I haven't, ran into any of the people uh, on the Nas at National Association that are involved in this lawsuit, which I, and I don't really know those players, um, but I do get, because we're just in the same building, I just get a lot of information. W what I, what I will say for anyone that isn't sort of familiar, how did we get here? And by the way, we just did an episode on this um, a few episodes ago, so I can always share that. If you, if you would like to hear it, please let me know. But here's everyone. There's going to be on. links in the description now. We'll have links. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or we'll what do we do the, the YouTuber thing of like, click here. Yeah. We'll point. <laughs> we'll say there's a button. Of, yeah. Over there. Yeah. Uh, so, so basically the way that the, this is all about commissions. And so commissions have been notoriously misunderstood, sort of not often fully disclosed to buyers and sellers, or certainly it's complicated and a little confusing. So basically the way that, you know, it works today as when there's two realtors in a transaction, somebody representing the seller, somebody representing the buyer, typically they you know, share the commissions called a cooperative commission. Of course, almost everyone already knows that, but why is it set up that way? Well, initially it was set up this way, according to National Association of Realtors, to help the first time home buyer not have to come up with the commission that their agent would receive helping them buy their home, right? To have to come up with an additional $10,000 or whatever the, the commission might be is obviously going to prohibit a lot of uh, renters or, or people who aren't buying to be able to actually make that, that first purchase. But so ask, it was yeah. like, yeah, it was like, maybe we'll have the seller pay both commissions. And then when that first time home buyer is ready to sell down the road, they'll pay it back by it's their turn to now pay. And really, you know, it, that's a, there's a logical argument to be made there. It makes sense. And it, it's worked for however many years that's been in place. The challenge with that is that that's not really explained to, to buyers and sellers. And, you know, it's just complicated and confusing and it's not all that transparent, even though it's pretty simple in concept. And what, what happens is the seller's agent, the person representing the, the seller, you know, gets to determine how much they get and how much the buyer's agent gets. And so that could be seen as problematic because now you have two sort of competing 
interests. You have the person representing the seller, person representing the buyer, trying to figure out how to negotiate. And they're also have their commissions to consider. So it just gets really ugly and messy. And what a lot of buyers have been told over the years by like, how do commissions work? is oftentimes a realtor who represents the buyer might say, you don't pay the commission. Don't worry about it. It's paid by the seller. It doesn't come out of your side. You don't have to write a check. But the reality of it is they are paying it because it's built, it's baked into the pricing. Right. So commissions are all baked into the price. So yeah, technically the buyer isn't writing a check to their agent. So they might think they're not really paying it, but they are really paying it just in a different, more indirect way. And it, it, so there's a massive lawsuit that happened in Missouri, which um, they were basically, you know, basically a class action lawsuit was brought where it was like, okay, is this collusion when we have these two, uh, two realtors who are in a closed system? So they are in, you know, they have to be members of, of associations to get access to the MLS. Is that appropriate, um, you know, going forward? Does that really prevent the, this buyer or the seller from, having sort of the best possible experience and, and getting the best possible um, price for their property and not having a lot of control over the commission structure. The buyers have had zero control over the commission structure. Sellers have, have control. So it, it's just kind of an antiquated system that probably needs a refresh. Uh, I'm not sure what that's going to look like, but anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm rambling, but that's essentially the crux of the argument is how do we, how do we, how do we decouple these commissions so that a buyer's agent potentially uh, is compensated by the buyer? And how is that going to look? How's that going to work? Because as we said earlier, buyers of them going to have to pony up some extra money and a lot of agents, buyers won't be able to do that. So how do we decouple these commissions and kind of get them as far away from each other as we can? I like how you said that basically it's like, it's been like this for a really long time. And the, the key point, you know, is maybe that like the buyers have not been able to explain very clearly, you know, like I'm sort of newer to the real estate world, but have done several transactions. And I still find that whole thing, like it's weird, kind of murky. Yeah. Like I understand that a little bit better than what title does. Uh, but yeah. you know, <laughs> we, we own a title company too. And don't ask me how title works because right. yeah. I'm an owner of the company and I'm completely in the dark about how that works. <laughs> We're going to have it's, an episode it's really with, confusing. with some title people and they're going to explain it all to us. Uh, but yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, what do you, where do you think this is going to go? Right. Because I've heard all sorts of like, you know, I, I think opinions have ranged from like, don't worry about it. Like just stick your head in the sand to, to, oh my God, it's going to shake everything up. You should just like panic without reason, which so, mm -hmm. so far I'm like, okay, we can cut off the extremes. I don't think either of those are healthy Yeah. Uh, right. to something a little bit more in the middle of like, Hey, you probably should be communicating with your customers about the value that you provide and having that conversation somewhere in there seems like the answer and the way out. Agreed. And uh, yeah, I, I couldn't have said that better. So what we, so we have 800 agents at our firm and one thing to, to note and that is in place is that the national association of realtors now has, and I believe this happened last, uh, last November, if I remember correctly, where you are now allowed as the listing agent to offer a zero co-op commission to the buyer's agent. Now, it's not that big of a shift from what was before. So technically prior to that, you could offer a $1 commission. So we basically have only changed, uh, the association has only changed it from going from $1 to zero. But regardless, those are essentially the same things. So but we don't see a lot of uh, co-op commissions at $1 or zero. And that's because in, in the past, the whole issue is see realtors are, are fiduciaries and they have a fiduciary responsibility. Uh, they're bound by the ethics. If they belong to a local and state association, who's a member of the national association, which almost all of them in the country are, there's a few that aren't, but it, that's, that is not the norm. So we're bound by this obligation to do what's in our client's best financial interest. However, we have to get paid. And if we, if I'm representing a buyer and I see a $1 or a $0 co-op commission, it means I'm not getting any money from the listing agent, uh, from the seller. Uh, if that transaction closes. And so now that is absolutely allowed. And so now 
re, you know, buyer agents are having to really think about what happens when we see this on the MLS. And it is coming. It, you may have already seen it. I I ask everybody I talk to on my show, have you seen this yet? Have you seen a zero dollar? And what are you going to do? Because as a fiduciary, you have to show that property if you think it's in your client's best interest. And yet you also need to get paid. So how do you navigate those waters? Well, the buyer's going to have to have, there's going to be a tough conversation about, hey, this may happen. If this happens, here's what we're going to do. And just an hour ago when I was at the gym, I ran into a realtor, not one of our realtors, I wish he was, but I asked him, I said, what are you saying to your buyers? Because he he said, well, he goes, we don't totally know yet, but um, what I've started to do is tell my buyers there, there's a change in compensation. We are going to do our best to secure my commission from the seller. So even if it shows on the co-op commission field on that listing, I'm not getting anything from the seller. I'm going to reach out to the seller and say, Hey, you know, I have a buyer. They're super interested. And, you know, we, I need to figure out a compensation model. Can you come to the table with something, which is how it's been done traditionally? In, if that doesn't work, then there's going to be an agreement and well, there's going to be an agreement in place anyway that says if that doesn't work uh, with my buyer, my buyer is going to have to come to the table with some sort of compensation. So as you said, it's about demonstrating and and really being able to communicate value. Why am I worth this? Right. So so and that's not an easy conversation because this is for for many 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 years buyers were not ponying up and writing a, a technically a check, um, but you're going to need to figure out that conversation before you're in that conversation because it's going to happen and you don't want to figure it out then. You want to figure it out now. And the easiest way to do that is to talk to your managing broker, talk to your firm and say, hey, what are, what are we recommending here? Because the, the, the two things to do is get a buyer uh, agency agreement, which just basically protects you and says, if we're unable to get a commission from the seller side, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, you're going to pay me. And you need to have, of course, you need, they need to sign it. They have to understand it. And you have to figure out what that compensation is. Um, and, um, yeah, so really that's the main, the main thing. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I love a lot of this, right. Um, and yeah, I mean, love in the sense that people are talking about it and then thinking about like what could happen. That's interesting. I was going to ask you if you'd heard of a, you know, a zero, dollar yet. And it sounds like the answer Not is yet. no. So everyone's kind of like waiting for it. Uh, it'll be like, it'll be like the pin drop that, you know, is heard around the world. Well, uh, well it, and it, it is going to happen because um, think of it the way that I like to think about it is forget I'm in this industry. Let's say I want to sell my condo and I, and I know that I don't technically have to now offer a co-op commission. And so I might think as the property owner, you know what, Mr. Listing agent that I, or Mr. Listing agent I'm hiring to sell this property. Let's try it at zero for the co-op side first. Let's see if we can just get a buyer to come directly to us. And I'm happy to pay you, Mr. and Mrs. Listing Agent, your two and a half percent or whatever. Um, but let's see if we can just get a buyer coming to us unrepresented. Uh, and that would save me as the seller two and a half percent. And I'd rather not pay two and a half percent because that might be 15 grand or whatever it is. So. I think you're going to see sellers start to just test it and see, is this going to work? I, so you're, and I could be wrong. Knowing knowing that you're an old school marketing guy, I think that you're going to appreciate this, right? So like when I was in college, like one of the first books that was like, you know, high velocity thrown at us was, uh, you know, Jack Trout, Al Rifkin, like differentiate or die. Right. And it's like the, the title is all you need to read, right? Differentiate or die. And I, I feel like that's what's coming because as we start to play out these conversations, it, the first thing that I would ask, you know, an agent that's thinking about this conversation is like, who's your customer? Right. Yeah. And, and then, yeah, you're going to, you're going to work out a deal accordingly. Right. So I was trying to remember where I'd heard it, whether it was one of our influencers or whether it was, um, it might've been the guys on the all in podcast that we're talking about, uh, you know, the way that they like to manage their real estate agents. And it's, it's kind of like, Hey, here's a minimum threshold that we're going to pay you. And then if you do better, you know, and, but it's a very different buyer. Like, obviously those guys are like super cash heavy and, you know, don't care, uh, you know, versus a first time home buyer that's, you know, going to do a Fanny Freddie, you know, <laughs> like whatever, uh, sure. you know, VA type type loan. Um, so yeah, I mean, th this is going to be really, really interesting thing. So, you know, I'm, 
Have you I'll tell you what I'm hoping for. So yeah. what I'm hoping for, if 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 nothing else changes, if this is just the structure going forward, and we are going to start, I, I suspect we will start to see sellers testing this zero co-op commission uh, option. I'm hoping lenders can come to the rent rescue. I don't know how compliant it is. I suspect they will figure out a way to make it compliant where ah, they can say, okay, Mr. First, Mr. and Mrs. First time home buyer, what we'll do is here's your loan, your traditional loan for the property. And here's a second loan for the commission paid to the uh, listing or to the buyer's agent. And, you know, it'll have its own mortgage. It'll have its own rate. It'll have its whatever. Because to a lender, why wouldn't they want to make more money? I mean, that's what they do. They lend money. So I suspect that they'll figure out a way to do that and all will be good. Um, But I don't know. I'm hoping that's what happens. That rhymes with, uh, there's a, one of our uh, longtime customers, Greg Harrelson, who works out of Myrtle Beach, uh, was basically talking about, you know, the lenders are going to be key to this whole situation, like unlocking it. And, you know, we could have problems because, you know, of the inability to finance this, you know, or maybe there's something there that we, that can be flexed or, or worked. Um, so yeah, your, your idea is, is interestingly similar or, you know, worst case scenario, buyers, agents, maybe go the way of the dodo. That would be sort of, I would think the most extreme thing that could happen. And all of a sudden buyers unrepresented will start just hiring attorneys and trying to figure out a way to to do it themselves and listing agents will reign supreme. I, I would say that's on the, the least likely option, but certainly could happen. Um, and that would be the biggest shift. Um, I, I'm hopeful that that doesn't happen, but we'll see. And that makes our system look a little bit more like international systems. If that were to happen. Yeah. For those listening to the audio, which I know you're out there because I was looking at the stats today. He's nodding. Uh, (laughs) I am nodding. I'm nodding in agreement. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) It it is interesting. You know, you, you, the argument, the the problem with the argument, the problem with the system as it's set up is the compensation is very generous. It really is. Now, realtors, we know how hard you work. I am not suggesting you're not working for your your income, and I'm not suggesting you're overpaid. But to an outside eye, there aren't too many major purchases like this with those kind of commissions. I mean, if you give somebody all of your assets to manage under uh, with a financial advisor, they're probably taking at most 1% per year, 2%. Mm-hmm. So that could be another option is... What we do is we don't charge transactional fees. We charge some sort of service fee like financial advisors do where you're going to pay, you know, 500 bucks a year or, or whatever. And then when it actually comes time to transact, you know, you get it for free or discount or something. So that's another option, more of a subscription model. I really hope that what comes out of this is some. You know, we already know that real estate agents are highly entrepreneurial. You wouldn't be doing this if you weren't, right? But you know, you're breaking out of the mold and thinking about like new, interesting ways to generate business here. And you know, I, I keep coming back to the, you know, th- the lawsuit is probably right in the sense that, like, if the buyer didn't know exactly what they were paying for, and the buyer and seller are like sort of keeping that vague. You know, it, I, there's been, this isn't the first time that there's been loan related, you know, consumer protection action that's happened that, sure. you know, is trying to protect consumers from, you know, hidden fees or moving interest rates or, or whatever. Insurance, you know? insurance companies are notorious for having issues like this. Like you, you buy a variable and, um, a variable universal life policy, right. which is essentially an investment account. And you might be paying six or 7% per year. You'll never see it in your statements. Right. Um, so yes, there are, there are some of these industries that have gotten away with that for a long, long time. So, you know, how do you make your client excited about doing business with you and feel like they're paying money and it's well spent, you know, like that's, that seems like the core of the problem. It is. And I think buyer's agents are just going to have to up their game and you're going to have to, right? And what I mean up your game, I don't mean becoming a better buyer's agent. I mean, being able to explain what you're doing and why you, why you deserve compensation and how did we get here? And also somehow communicating to the buyer, this is not a bad thing. This is actually just, it's a, it's a shift. But, but once the top agents are going to have no problem with this, they already have it figured out. They know what they say, what they're going to say. I, I've talked to tons of top producers about this. They're all like, 
they, they have a plan and they're just like, yeah, we're, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens, but they're not worried. I think it's going to be the part-time agents that are really going to s- struggle and suffer with this. Yeah, definitely. I hope it's coming across. I feel like I'm rooting for the, you know, the buyer's agents here to, to figure it out. Like change is scary, but this is going to be like good for everyone. You change know? is always scary. Yeah. You know, this as, as an owner, like any, we, we just hired a CEO at our, at our company because we needed accountability and we, <laughs> we needed somebody that was going to, I mean, for yeah. lack of a better word, crack, crack the whip on all of us. And boy, I'll tell you, it is not fun. Um, as much as I know it's the best thing for our business. I do not like being held accountable for things when I'm like, I'm the CMO. I get to do what I want. And I'm pounding my fists on the table and the floor going, you know, stop, uh, stop. Uh, and he's like, well, that's why you hired me. You hired me to, yeah. to, to keep you in line. And so I think that, that we're going to start to see agents really, you know, being held a little bit more accountable for their, for their commissions. They're going to have to defend their commissions. But you know what? Attorneys have to defend their commissions, uh, or their, their payments. You know, service providers have to defend their payments. This is not, it's not, we're not, right. pay, I don't think realtors are being picked on here. I think it's just, they just didn't have to do this in the past. Right, right, right. Exactly. Okay. So, you know, it's interesting hearing about like kind of flashback to your connection with the NAR uh, organization. And so I'm interested to, you know, if there's any tea leaves you want to read about like, you know, what about the, or, the NAR organization? Yeah. Where do you think that's going to go? And how does this going to play out with MLSs? And Yeah. You know? Yeah. So can the whole MLS system change? Uh, you know, it's, it's a closed system. They can argue that it's an unfair system for people who want to play outside of that space. They really don't have an easy entry point. Um, so, and the local and state associations are starting to get annoyed with some of the challenges that uh, NAR has had. You know, I, I certainly don't need to go over their list of challenges over the last several years, but there's been sexual misconduct allegations. There's, you know, uh, th- these lawsuits. And, you know, quite frankly, that's that's troubling. And so I don't have uh, I, I really don't know because I I really volunteer at the local level. And you would think that I would have some information based on kind of what the local association is thinking. Um, I think it's just too early to tell. I, I suspect the national association does, I think have some accountability to sort of own and, and try to repair. And I, I think that, I would like to see more communication from them about here's why this is happening. Here's our plan to correct it. And if we, lose one of the commission, like the commission lawsuit. Here's our plan for making sure our 1.4 million realtors in the country can still earn a living. That's what I would like to see. And they've sort of done little mini steps of that. They're still in litigation, but you know, there there's problems. Do we need, and I, this is maybe an unpopular opinion, but do we actually, we had an issue with one of the presidents with a sexual misconduct allegation. So every year there's a president that's elected from the body of realtors and it's more ceremonial than anything. Um, it's more like, Hey, we're going to take one of our, our agents and say, Hey, you're, you're, you're representing the whole country for realtors. Um, and do we need that every year? I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I feel like it's just too problematic now with everyone's histories being, uh, you know, been recorded online at least. And everyone's got something they said at some point that could possibly come back to not be seen as, you know, um, what we would want from one of our leaders. And, and I think it's just people just are imperfect. And, you know, that could be one thing that would possibly help is maybe not having a, a president. Now, I, I, again, I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't celebrate uh, our top agents and, and the, the people who want to lead the organization. It's very um, uh, impressive that they want to do that. Um, but, um, you know, it creates problems too when we've, we've had a couple of shakeups uh, of presidents over the last several years. So it's a problem. <laughs> I like the hot take though. All right, we're, we're about that here. So no president, you know, um, interesting. Yeah. It doesn't really matter. The president doesn't really do anything. And it's just kind of a like pat on the back to that person for all their service and support. And, and again, yes, give them an award, give them a medal, give, put them on the front page of the magazine, whatever. Um, I don't know that they need to lead the organization because they're not really leading the organization. They're just getting a, an office for a year and some sort of salary to do it. And um, maybe that's, maybe that's just not needed. MLSs. So you talked a little bit about, you know, NAR, MLSs. Yeah. I mean, you know, I thought when I first got into this industry, it's funny. I, I had a friend who's on the board of Nerd Wallet or I think Nerd Wallet. Anyway, or Bankrate, one of those Bankrate. And, um, 
and and he works a lot in this space. Um, they're mostly a lead generation company, as as people know. And so I I asked him. This is 14 years ago, and he goes, I can't. He goes, we're not going to need realtors in five years. I said, really? He goes, tech is just going to take it over. And I said, well, I hope not, because that's my whole profession. But um, but he was wrong, or he's been wrong so far. And that so, prediction is out there a lot. It's, it's so been out there forever. Been wrong. Yeah. yeah. It's been wrong because you, when really good agents are worth their, their commission because, you know, it's a, such a large financial transaction. For most people, it's the largest financial transaction they'll make. So it's, it's important to get some help along the way. Um, about MLSs, I would say Zillow came around in early 2000s and said, let's figure out maybe a, a more uh, open system, right? And so they initially, um, you know, basically started creating agreements with associations to be able to show those listings publicly. You no longer needed a, a key to get into the MLS system. If you were a consumer, you just go to Zillow and 99% of the listings on the MLS are going to be on Zillow. So that's mm. pretty cool. And they do it for free. And Zillow is a lead, a lead generate, lead gen company. So for them, they sell their leads to realtors. And then, um, Zillow became a brokerage because for, for very specific reasons. And I don't think it was to take over, uh, realtor jobs, but uh, there's different, differing opinions on that. But, um, but they became a brokerage. And anyway, could they become the default MLS going forward if the MLS system comes down? And could our, could our, could realtors still survive outside of the MLS protected system? Um, I would hope so. I, I don't know. Um, but could we see the MLS going away entirely? Maybe. I mean, there's, there's a, there's a reasonable argument to be made that it, being a closed system prevents uh, competition. And, you know, um, that's a problem, I think, for, for consumer advocacy groups. So I don't know. I guess if you're thinking about the, the meta of what's going on out there in the economy, it's not that Zillow owns everything, right? Like if, if you actually add up all the traffic to all the real geek sites, that's more traffic than goes to Zillow, right? Sure. But it's atomized, right? Like right. it's sort of for, for the agents. So I would probably agree. I, I would probably like, yeah, Zillow being a monster or one of the portals, and I want to ask you about the portal wars here, uh, you know, might be able to get like a dominant position. But I, I think as long as Google exists and as long as they're not like doing their own thing or hyper favoring one site, you know, there's there's room for competition there. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'll let you react to that. And then I'm going to ask you about like, you know, Zillow versus homes.com. Uh it seems yeah, it's 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 interesting. So you know the fact that Z that Google hasn't built some sort of real estate portal into their search engine is a little surprising. Um, I would assume that th that's an intentional thing. I'm, I'm obviously they've thought about it, and for some reason they haven't dipped their toe specifically into that water. Just because I think for regulatory issues they would have to get compensated in some way, and it would it would likely just. Although I don't know. I mean, maybe not. Maybe they become a lead gen company like Zillow and start just sell leads to realtors, or you know who knows. Um, but could Google like? Well, let's riff on this here for a second because yeah. this, this is an interesting question. Why hasn't Google done this? And it kind of strikes me that it's not their core business. Like their core right. business is really like aggregating information and making it available. So right. if there's a feed they can consume or a bunch of feeds that they can consume, then yeah. So, you know, maybe I, I'm trying to almost, almost like think about this, like, you know, how does podcasting work and it's sort of like you use your your one client to look at multiple feeds yeah you know and so the the question becomes like where are you listing you know and so are you going to are you going to list your property site rather than with one mls like you have a feed that you put out there into the world that gets right. picked up by multiple aggregators or are you submitting it to multiple sites and it gets out that way or like yeah. there's callbacks to your site or like you know, th there probably is room for some technology disruption in there. I agree. I, I think if we look at the Google flight, which used to be called the Google flight matrix now is called right. just, I think it's flights.google.com. Anyway, mm -hmm. now they have basically taken what Expedia and Travelocity sort of pioneered and said, Oh, we can just do that right on our, on our search engine. And we can get a little spiff on every time some, just like Travelocity right. or, or Expedia does. And I would suspect that Google flights is probably the number one player in that space right now. And all they had to do was aggregate all those feeds, 
create relationships with those, uh, you know, airlines and then just work out some sort of compensation agreement. And, and I suspect there's probably even flights that they aren't compensated on, but Google just says, well, we got to have them all in there if we expect people to use our stuff. So I suspect not everyone, they probably aren't even getting a commission on every sale, on every flight that they're selling, but I use it every single time. So is there a room for a disruptor that comes and says, we're going to aggregate all the listings. We're going to figure out a compensation model. Maybe it's advertising, which is, you know, obviously Google's, uh, that's the primary mode of generating income is, is their advertising. So could they just put it all up for free and then pay, you know, uh, have ads? Um, sure. hundred percent. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it, it'll be interesting. Can they aggregate all these non MLS sources and possibly even MLS sources and put it together and it ceases to be really a closed system, meaning that a buyer can more easily get access to a property uh, without having to pay a buyer's agent. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is interesting stuff. This is, this is fun to think about. I probably say to people at this point, like, you know, there's probably the portal proponents out there. They're like, oh, whatever's going to happen is going to happen really fast. And in the long geologic span of history, it seems like that happens. But if you really think back onto like, you know, remember HD DVDs, you know, like they were battling it out with Blu-rays for a while, you know, and so the technology is going to, going to take a while to settle down. I guess I, I tend to think that the MLS is probably won't go anywhere immediately. They'll probably need to open up. I think that, you know, but, but I think at the same time, it's like, you know, it's hard to imagine that like if government, you know, in, in sort of this big blobular sense, which I don't think there's any sort of like one direction that, that, that entity has, you know, is going for like more consumer protection that all of a sudden it would like, they would enable a monopoly, you know, being Zillow or one of the other portals to then just own the market. You know, that doesn't, that doesn't like strike me as the right, you know, direction. Yeah, I agree. And also too, you never really want, obviously as a, as a business, you never want one business controlling the vast majority of any market because they can continue to grow. I mean, we, look, I, I, I love Amazon. I'm an Amazon customer and I'm not in any way criticizing that them for growing, but you know, how many people have they hooked to you know, I had to order something. My car went, uh, uh, my battery went, was dead this morning. Um, cause I left something on and I was like, Oh shoot, I need to figure out how I'm getting a jump. And it was in this spot where I couldn't easily get jumped. So I was like, I'm going to order a portable jumper and it's being, it already got delivered, you know, five yeah. hours later. And yeah. It was a hundred bucks. And yeah. how does a mom and pop store locally to me? And I live in the city. I live amongst all this great local stuff in Chicago and, and retailers. And I went straight to Amazon and I bought it. Should I have? No, I would have been, but it would have been better for my community if I went to the local auto parts store and said, Hey, I'll buy it from you guys. But I, I was in a rush and I needed it. Um, it's so attractive to do that. And that's where you have to that's where I think the worry becomes about somebody like Azilla who bought Trulia, um, you know, certainly other, other websites too. And, and, and again, I, I like Zillow. I, I think Zillow is actually a really cool company. I just think we have to figure out how big is too big and how, when does it start to actually hurt the consumer because other, other players are having a hard time getting a foothold. Well, and Zillow's got competition, right? You know, there was oh, some yeah. Super Bowl ads, you know, so, yep. you know, got any hot takes on uh, the portal wars. They seem like they're, you know, heating up. Yeah, they're heating up. Zillow is still clearly in first place. And so I don't, I think so Zillow did such a great job of branding. And I, I'll say I've toured the Zillow uh, offices. I've been lucky enough to, to visit with some of their senior leadership and just kind of learn like, how'd you guys do this? And, you know, they really, the, the brilliance of Zillow was just, we are all about the customer experience. Buying a home is hard. And we wanted to figure out what do customers actually want and what's the easiest way for them to get to this information. And that was a, a little bit of a shift from before of let's just put all the information up on a website, sort of, you know, we're going to tweak it as best we can for user experience. But Zillow it, it tracks everything. And so they just have more data than everyone. So they can make better user experience uh, decisions because they have better data because they're the big player. So I worry that they're 
just going to continue. Now, again, uh, everything's got a, a lifespan too, right? Companies come and go. Zillow might, and somebody might disrupt the industry with a brand new technology that's even better. For example, I'm excited, you know, with this, the 5G sort of promise has not really come true yet, where I'd love to see faster in, in access to information. I'd love to see things like heads up displays inside of cars, whereas you drive down a street, up on your windshield is pricing or, or whatever, uh, you know, sh- showing you, um, you know, in this like augmented reality scenario, uh, th- that should be here by now. And, and it's not, um, eventually we'll get there. So I'm excited to see what's next, but I think access to information has to improve I- its speed. The speed has to improve because right now it's just, it takes just a few too many steps and, it, and you know, it sounds silly to think it takes steps because you really you just go to a website and start searching. But the reality of it is, I think it, that can be improved, and there can start to be companies in AI. I think will help with this. Will they'll start to create um, avatars of people and, and really you know checking their behavior and kind of who they are and have so much access to who you are as a person that they can start to suggest things to you that are actually accurate. And I, I'm hopeful that that's. I mean, we're sort of seeing some of that anyway now. Yeah, I mean, great segue, uh, you know, because here's the other we we talked about it at the top of the show, you know, like hot topic of the moment, you know, everything's AI all the time. You know, you want to get some attention, sprinkle some AI on it. Uh, you know, I I think that, you know, I, I'm loving what you're saying here. It's like kind of spoken, spoken like a true, tr- true technology guy, you know, like if you can eliminate friction, you're going to win. Um, you know, but what do you what are you hearing out there on like hot takes on on AI, like are people adopting it? Are there novel uses that are not just, you know, generating little blobs of text? Um, Yeah. Right now it seems to be creative use. So, mm -hmm. you know, agents can throw in a description and say, make this more persuasive or make this more appealing to a certain type of, uh, of buyer uh, or make this, you know, dumb down the language or, or, you know, ramp up the language. And, and, and you know, so for create creative sort of uh, prompts or creative rewrites, obviously we know the value of AI. Probably everyone's tried it in that respect. Some way they've thrown some text in and gotten a, a decent text back. I think the way that I think about AI is more of like the, the, the Oracle at Delphi. I think it's going to be this thing that eventually as it gets better and better, we're going to be, we're going to get accustomed to asking it questions. This is really what Siri and Google home assistant and, uh, you know, other, other, mo- uh, sort of AI assistant models have tried to do, and they haven't really done it. Alexa as well, haven't done it as successfully as probably anyone would have hoped. And now we're, we're seeing this ability to say, Hey, how about this? So here's an example of, of a way that I tried this just, it just occurred to me. It's, it, and, and I thought this was pretty cool. So I, uh, I can't remember why I did this, but I had to, I put in an address. So I'm not a practicing agent, but for some reason I had to, I was looking up an address or maybe it just occurred to me to do this. But anyway, it doesn't matter. I, I was said, tell me everything you know. I asked chat GBT, the free version, by the way, not even the paid version. Tell me everything you know about this address. And it was just some random address and it knew. Oh no, it was, it was my own place. That's what it was. It was my own place. And it, because I, I'm in a newer development, it knew what countertops I had. It knew what the price points were. It knew so much. Now, how did it get that information? It likely scraped it from the website that was initially promoting the development and maybe some other use. I don't know where it got the information, but it was accurate. It was fast. It was within 10 seconds. And I thought this is really cool because yes, as an agent, you can now just plug this into chat GBT before any showing. And, and then if it's like, well, maybe it doesn't know anything about the property. Then I would say, tell me about the neighborhood or tell me about the surrounding areas or what are some cool facts about this area? So for getting little tidbits of information, I think it's really, really helpful right now. So for agents that are listening, you know, ask your, ask it questions that would help you better communicate with your client, right? So what do clients care about when they're wanting to buy a property? What's in the surrounding area? What are the schools like? What are the, you know, where's the grocery store? And all of, all of those things. Um, so I think that's a, a really kind of fun use case is just start asking it to help you with your own showings. Okay, so I just asked GPT four about my personal address, and uh, it, it choked on this. It actually said, "I'm sorry, I don't have access to specific uh, information on that address." But that is a guard war- guardrail. Um, that's the kind of answer that you see when they've decided that they didn't want to give you that information. Not that it's exactly. not there, 
right? right. Um, so, wow, that's that's a super interesting use case. Uh, yeah, and, and if and if you do run across that guardrail, then I would just alter the query to say, okay, well, tell me um, any fun facts about the neighborhood, or tell me fun facts about the suburb, or the or it, you guys are in University Park, I think your your company um, yep. in in Dallas. So I, you guys are right near SMU, right? So. Again, you're, you're, you know, we're just using that as an example, but I would be like, tell me everything about University Park, right? So tell me like 20 fun facts about University Park or tell me about what, what type of people are moving into University Park and, you know, just give me some in, in demographic information so that I can start to understand the, the area better. So I think it'll really help realtors better learn uh, about properties and, and areas. Yeah, no, that's super interesting because actually, um, I mean, even this morning I was playing with, um, Bing's copilot for, yeah. which is like chat GPT with a yeah. copilot, uh, you know, the yeah. travel copilot. And I was talking, I was ha- having a conversation with it about like, okay, I want to go to Spain. I want to go to Barcelona. I want to go to Rioja. I want to go to Tenerife. Like, tell me what I should do here. Like, all right, that seems a little touristy. Where else should I go? You know? And, and travel, that segment is so dominated by, you know, people with, a you know, a lot of time to spend on SEO uh, that like shifting, sorting through those 10 blue links, you know, on Google is a lot of times like difficult. Right. But it felt sort of natural to have that conversation on that topic, you know, with the AI. Um, That's an, that's an interesting one talking about neighborhoods and places to move and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Here's what I'm waiting for. And this is not necessarily real estate specific, but I think it can help all of us, or at least would help me is helping me plan my day. So realtors, we know have to wear every possible hat. You know, you're your own business. You're, you're in charge of all, uh, all aspects of the business, unless you're on a team and, and most agents aren't. So this, it would be really cool if chat GBT or, or, you know, any of the other AI systems, somebody could build a plugin that looks at my calendar is connected to, I use to doist. So be connected to your to-do list system and looks at everything, looks at your projects, looks at, you know, if you're a realtor, maybe looks at your existing open deals, looks at, and, and this is being developed. I am sure it, currently, I can't wait for this to be an actual virtual assistant. Um, it, it's where they can actually say, okay, here's what you're doing today. Because if I could eliminate the planning of my day, and I'm sure every realtor can appreciate this as well. Things are going to get thrown at you all day anyway. And, and as a business owner, Chris gets, uh, he has to wear every hat as well. So he, he, he can appreciate this. It would, for me, at least, I would love not to have to plan my day. And I, I have an assistant that helps me do that. And it's just, I need, I need a better system. It's not her fault. It's, it's, I don't, I'm not good at it. You know, and I don't, it's hard to communicate everything to her, but if I could figure out a structure where it could literally say, now you're doing this in the next hour, you're doing this. Um, that's what I can't wait for. And I'll pay big money for that. I, I got to be careful what I say here because I'm not sure uh, how much we've talked about publicly. Uh, but, you know, Real Geeks has uh, an AI SEO product. Uh, we also have what we call Geek AI, which is like the chat bot that talks to clients. And love it. That, you know, we, we always tell people not to do this. Like, but if you do, if you don't intervene, the chat bot will try and get to setting an appointment. And it, it's like weirdly good at it. Um, like it, it, it's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, the next generation of that is coming out and I've been watching, you know, again, I gotta be careful what I say here. Uh, but what you say, you know, is almost just a matter of like, what data we expose to it. Kevin, if you're listening, it, like, come on now, <laughs> like hook us well, up. Well, no, I mean, look, <laughs> you guys have an unbelievable yeah. CRM, right? Yeah. How, co- and, and I know it's coming. I'm not asking right. you to comment on this, but here's what is going to come at some point. Real geeks at some point will, I'm, I'm making a prediction. This is not, uh, I have no knowledge of this, but every, every app Trello now has a, everyone has yeah. AI, uh, some sort of module. It's not that good yet. All the different ones, literally every uh, service provider I have now has an AI widget. I'm like, I don't even know what to do with that yet. But at some point, you know, uh, real geeks will have something that says, Hey, we looked at your day today. We looked at your CRM. Here's who you're calling. Here's what you're doing. Here's, and we can go ahead and schedule it for you. And we can remind you every hour to do X, Y, and Z. It's not that complicated, really. Uh, it will yeah. be there. You guys, you guys will be participating in it in some way. And I am super excited for that because we, I, I, I we know that crafty, if you're really crafty, you probably could set that up today. Yep. Uh, but 100%. you know, give us like a year and what you're talking yep. about is like probably everyone will be like, how did we live without this? Yeah. Uh, (laughs) 
And, and to me, yeah. I see that as a huge, for me at least, that would be life changing for me. So I'm excited, and I know it's just a race to to get it done now. So, um, well, there's I'm very so many good. You know, I, I kind of think. Um, you know, I've been lo- also looking at like a lot of our competitors, uh, you know, AI products. And I, I feel like, uh, I'm going to put us all in the same boat here. I kind of feel like we're talking about generation one. We're all t- doing the things that are obvious, right? And, uh, and there's going to be like this next generation as soon as, especially once we start seeing the usage statistics and talking to our customers, um, uh, and it's like, oh, that's going to unlock a lot more productivity. Right. Uh, you know, and so that that's coming, you know, you, we just, we just know we're waiting for that light bulb to turn on. So, yeah, I, I think AI has, has at least for realtors has the ability to streamline a lot of mundane, uh, re- repeatable tasks and come up with some creative solutions for tasks. And eventually, uh, you know, I think it's going to be a real two way conversation. I think it's going to be a lot of like, Hey, what about this? Okay. You said that. Okay. And I think it's going to be a lot more voice, uh, versus uh, text. And, and I, I think, or, 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 you know, uh, typing, I think it's really going to be like, you're going to be chatting with somebody all day long is what I think. Interesting. Interesting. I don't know. We'll yeah, see. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, uh, I agree with that. I think that'll be like probably the front end, um, you know, but then I think there's probably going to be like layers of these things behind the scenes that yeah. are, you know, talking to each other. So, you know, going back to, you know, what, what here at the Real Geeks marketing team, you know, we talk about is, uh, you know, I've been encouraging my team to really get deep in this stuff because I kind of feel like this is outside of real estate, but I think it applies to real estate that, you know, newer players are going to almost have manager like skills, but instead of managing other people, it's like a managing a fleet of, of, you know, robots, you know, and getting them to all play nice together. And this is kind of when we get into the idea of prompt engineering. And so there's probably a whole generation of kids that, you know, we've been thinking about like the cell phone native, you know, generation, but there's going to be an AI native generation here starting soon. And who knows how that's going to change everything. Yeah. I mean, it's basically getting access to information is, is, is now, uh, you know, increased exponentially. And so this idea of prompt engineering of teaching people how to get access, how to get the answers as quickly as possible is going to be, it's, I bet it's, it's going to be its own, you know, degree that you can get in college. It has to be, uh, it's, it's going to be that important. Um, and developers are already using it going, Hey, here's our code, uh, make it more efficient. And it's pretty effective at doing that. You know, there's probably no bigger concern than interest rates and the state of the market. And I, you, you know, you, you run a very large brokerage, you talk to a lot of top producers. I'm I'm always interested about what's the word on the street. Like, how are people feeling? What, what are people doing? What are the consumers saying? Like, what's going on out there? Realtors are notoriously afraid of their buyer clients because it's hard to convince somebody to buy in an interest rate environment where it's seven point whatever as of in 2024, right? So Three years ago, you could get a 3% mortgage and people, it hasn't been enough time to where people have forgotten that yet. So that is, that is a bit of an uphill battle. However, it's important. I think that realtors remember what it was like to be a realtor during that time. It wasn't fun. It actually wasn't fun because everybody who had a few dollars was trying to buy a property. And we were seeing as, as Chris and anyone listening remembers, you know, just insane. I live in Austin, and, Texas. I know oh. exactly what was going on. You know, like if you had income, you could buy yourself a yep. multi-million dollar home. Uh, yep. <laughs> yeah. It was and you crazy. were paying you were paying over what it what was asked and you likely didn't, you had to give up a lot of, con- you had to make a lot of concessions. Oh, so yeah. let's, what I would recommend if for anyone listening who is struggling with my buyers are sitting on the fence, they're waiting for rates to come down. When rates come down, prices will go up. It's just what's going to happen. And y- if it was me, I would have a really strong argument. If you can make a strong argument with the data to say it's actually better to buy now. And, and this is what all the top agents uh, that I'm talking to are basically saying. And they're saying, you know, for two years or, or, or whatever, however long they're going to be at this uh, mortgage uh, interest rate to maybe two or three years. Yeah, you're going to have to sort of eke it out, but then we'll refi and, you know, uh, rates will likely drop and we will eventually get to a place. But at least you're not paying $50,000 over asking price today. You're, you're getting 
you're getting things at a discount today and you always want to buy low and sell high. You always, always, always. So yes, rating for interest rates to come down is very exciting. I mean, I have a 3% mortgage. I'm very happy with that. I'm likely never going to give that up, of course, if, unless I have to. But, um, but I just got lucky with mine. Mine just, I went and bought something that it just happened to coincide with the 3% thing. It wasn't because of the 3% interest rate environment why I bought it. It really wasn't. And so I think most people just want to buy the home they love. So don't, I would say he, you need to have a really compelling argument with data to show that let's, sh- let's look at what pricing was like when in 3% interest rates. Let's right. look at the list price and what things sold for. Um, you know, and, and being able to make that, uh, make that sort of uh, case, I think will help agents work with buyers today. You know, one of the things that was interesting for me watching this is I, I like to get down into the economics of this and like kind of watch national average, you know, like, you know, you, you, you learn in your college economics classes about supply and demand and equilibrium and, you know, stuff like this. And, and it's all very academic, but it's kind of interesting to look at what actually happens when interest rates go up, which changes the, the monthly cost of owning a home. And then w- what happens to prices after that? And I thought it was very interesting that, you know, at least in the Austin area, you know, it seemed like the correction wasn't immediate. Right. You know, and I think a lot of people expected the price correction to be immediate and it, it, yeah. it's not right because you got to wait for all of that to like trickle through the minds of the people actually in those, in those transactions. So there was some lag effect there. Um, so yeah, I do wonder. It's like, okay, so it, have most of the price corrections happened and now is the perfect time to buy or is the Fed going to torture us a little bit more? And, you know, and there's still, still some room, but I, I kind of agree with you that. You know, there's probably some deals out there, you know, if you're either a cash buyer or you can handle the the higher interest rate for the moment. Yeah. And look, I mean, there's been times in our history where it's been in double digits have been the norm. So yeah. this is not the sky is falling at all. It's just uncomfortable. But remember when, when, when rates go down, buyers come out and, and they're going to start competing with each other. It's always better, always better with less competition, right? To get the price you want. So it, it, simple economics, uh, there, but you need to be able to, to really explain and defend that because the buyer is not going to feel good about getting a seven and a half percent mortgage. It's just not. It's a psychologically <laughs> dissatisfying number. It doesn't feel right. good. So right. you, you, you have to jump that hurdle with a lot of data and facts and then, it, it's likely not going to be a problem. Well, I think it comes back to almost what we were talking about at the top of the episode of like, you know, knowing your customer and knowing why they're doing it, right? Like the core drivers of why someone undertakes the largest, one of the largest transactions of their lives, you know, it's hasn't changed, you know, like it's going to be the same reasons, you know? So, uh, yeah, um, it, it's just the palatability, right? Making them feel good about that, about that decision. So, yeah. And, and I think, you know, anyone listening, um, I think salesmanship is, uh, is, is kind of a dirty word these days. And I think most of us, as we've gotten more access to information, we rely less upon a salesperson and more upon just facts and data. So the salespeople used to be, in this case, realtors used to be the gateway to properties. They are not anymore. Right. So, you know, same with, you know, a lot of other industries. So you used to be at the mercy of the salesperson and, and hope that they were ethical and honest and, and, and a good agent or good whatever. Um, but now you can do so much of that legwork yourself. So if you're an agent and you are going to have this, you know, you want to sort of encourage your buyers to not necessarily stop looking today. You need to really have some strong, a strong argument to have them consider and with facts and data, because I hate to be sold, but I love getting information. So if I can, you know, my accountant doesn't need to sell me every year. She needs to just be like, here's what you're doing this year. Here's why you're doing it. Here's how much money you're going to save as a result. That's all I, I, and my doctors, I, I want my doctor to be like, I've looked at all your stuff. Here's what you need to do. And uh, here's why you need to do it. And I trust my doctor because they're the expert. So realtors need to remember they're the expert, but you have to really project that. And I think realtors often do themselves a little bit of a disservice on social media where it's a lot of grandstanding. It's a lot of 
you know, patting yourselves on the back. My accountant doesn't ever post, you know, Hey, I, I worked with a thousand clients this year. How cool am I? Or, or I just closed this big uh, business yeah. uh, to do our accounting. I'm not saying you can't do that or shouldn't do that. But if you lead with value, as opposed to here's my accomplishments, right. I think people tend to respond. At least I tend to respond better to that. And I know a lot of other people do as well. Right, right, I right. I think that's a that's a better marketing message. Okay, so maybe one more thought before we we leave this. You know, it's like interest rates obviously drive a big portion of that, but there's there's still a demand, you know, thing. We're heading to spring, you know, which is like kind of the traditional like big moving uh you know, do you do you think that there's like, you know, pent up demand that, you know, this thing might break regardless of what yeah. interest rates are doing because, you know, People got to move. They got to get their kids in school. They got to, you know, they got to do all the things. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I, I think people are going to wait until those interest rates drop because I think realtors aren't, haven't been trained enough on how to have that conversation. I, I truly believe that's just the reality of it. I could, I hope I'm wrong. And I hope that realtors are skilled enough to sort of give somebody the right information so that they can make the best decision for themselves. But it's a lot easier as a realtor to go, I'll just wait until interest rates come down. Now it's not going to pay the bills in the, in the interim, but at least I don't have to have a tough conversation. No, you know what? I, uh, I, I've been managing marketing teams for a long time at, at a lot of like big companies. And I, one of the things that I hate is when, you know, you're doing your morning stand up and the, the, the marketing team says, well, you know, there was a, a national emergency in Florida. And so that's why national sales were down. Look at CNN. And I'm like, no, that's not why people weren't buying real estate technology yesterday. Like right. there was something going on with us. And so I liked what you said there because it's like the real estate agents should realize that like, it's, it's, that it's, you just said like, it's on you, right? Like, if you can come up with the right reasons, if you can steer the person in the right direction, help them make the best decision, then, you know, the macro obstacles are not going to stop you. And really just thinking about it as, as you're not an employee, employees have the the luxury sometimes of waiting for senior leadership to make whatever changes and they can kind of still get paid in the background. And it, it, you think of a more employee mentality and you, you know, just keep going and hope that things get better. Yes. Um, I think a lot of realtors think of that with, with respect to interest rates, like, well, you know, nothing I can do and my clients don't want to do anything. So I'm just going to go wait it out. I'm going to complain about it. Whereas no, if you can com- create a compelling argument, you will not have those barriers uh, around right. your customers that you just won't, you just have to up your game. You have to have a better value proposition. Right. Right. DJ, this has been awesome. I'm so glad that we did this episode. Uh, just, I, I've been having a great time chatting with you. I think we're probably getting to the point where like people are like, all right, enough. Uh, so Yeah. Why don't you tell people uh, where they can find you? Yeah, yeah. So uh, two things I'll mention. By the way, if you are a realtor, I I would be remiss. uh, My boss would kill me if I didn't do this. Uh, I, I would be remiss to say if you are an agent in the Chicagoland area and you aren't getting what you are wanting from your firm and just want to see another option, give us a uh, reach out to us. We're Kale Realty, Kale Like the Vegetable. Uh, I would be honored to talk to you and think, see if you might be a, a we would be a good fit for you. Um, and everyone who's listening, no matter where you are in the world, we would love to have you check out our podcast as well, Keeping It Real. By the way, Real Geeks is our main sponsor. We love them. Uh, we are so honored to have them on our on our side. And um, we would love to introduce you to that if you haven't checked it out. So keepingitrealpod.com is our website. You don't have to go there. Just go to any podcast app, pull up, a, do a, pull up a search, type in Keeping It Real. Subscribe to Real Geeks if you haven't already. They're Keeping It Real. And we would appreciate a subscription as well to ours. It's free. Um, so please check it out. We have lots and lots of episodes. And also, if you have any top producers that are doing some really cool things in your market, you'd like to know how they did it, let us know. We'll reach out to them and get them on the show. Okay. Something I just started doing last episode, which I recorded on Monday, uh, was, you know, I was looking at the analytics earlier in the day and I'm like, you know, some people listen to the end, not everyone, you know, obviously not a lot of people, but I feel like we should start asking questions back here. And, you know, pose them to the audience. So the people that are still here, you know, answer this question, put it in the comments, you know, and we'll know that you made it all the way to the end, that you absorbed all the information. So what do you think that question should be? 
What's your biggest challenge right now? Because when you, when we can get that question answered, we can, uh, both Chris and myself, we can tailor episodes to meet your needs. So I would love to hear two things. I'd love to know what's your biggest challenge and what's working for you right now. Those would be two super cool things. So if you can share that with us, um, you know, we, that, that really helps us, you know, sort of create content. All right, DJ, thank you. Thanks for bringing it home. Everyone, like, subscribe. Go subscribe to his podcast. Subscribe to our podcast. Do all the podcasts. <laughs> all right. This has been and, awesome. And most importantly, if you don't have a CRM or if your CRM, it, you just want, even if you have a CRM, get a second opinion and you want a website, you want a CRM, you want to see Real Geeks is at the very top of the mountain with it, with respect to features and benefits, really. I don't work for them. So I'm, I'm saying this uh, just as a fan. Please check them out. They're amazing and they're, they're worthy of checking out. I wouldn't say that if I didn't believe it. So every Everyone listening, if you're not already a customer of, of Real Geeks, please consider becoming one. All, all the top agents I know, most of them all, not all of them, but most of them do use Real Geeks. So we're big fans. I see it in the industry. Most of my guests use it. So it, it works. So, uh, you know, consider uh, that for your brokerage. And if you don't want to pay for it, talk to your managing broker, have them get on a call with one of the sales guys. Maybe they can work something out. So boom. With that, we're out. <laughs>